truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a higher hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Let's stand together as we sing 10,000 Reasons for Prayer. Mm -hmm.
thank you and praise you for this opportunity that we had. Lord, change us from the inside out, make us more like you. And thank you and praise you in advance for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the, the author of the book of James, um, there's, there's a few different Jameses, three or four different ones in the New Testament. This is a, a brother of Jesus and a prominent leader of the Jerusalem Council. And you can read it see more of him in Acts chapter 15. Uh, he was there, uh, a very, very prominent leader. And what we're holding in our hands here this morning was not just, not just a book with chapters and verses and with subheadings and cross-references and study notes. This was a letter, and it was penned by a caring pastor to, to written to Jewish Christians from all the 12 tribes. And these Christians fled their homes for fear of persecution and death. Uh, most likely, perhaps, um, those were fleeing from uh, when they heard about the stoning of Stephen. And so they, they fled. And these Christians had fled everything. They fled their homes, their jobs, their possessions, their way of life, their comfort, everything they knew. And they were scattered to countries unfamiliar to them. They were hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles from home, hope, probably hoping to find some kind of refuge and safety, whether it was somewhere by themselves or among another community willing to take them in. Given the events of the last week or two, does this sound a little too familiar? As we read the second half of the first chapter, Elder James, he shares practical wisdom. The book of James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. He shares his practical wisdom with his church family that he often addresses throughout the letter as his dear brothers and sisters. And we start to understand that these were some very, very difficult circumstances. And these believers were facing some incredible trials and temptations. And James' address is familial, but through the Holy Spirit's unction, his instruction is firm. Now before we jump right into the theme of those instructions, there is something to be said about the nature of our trials as it relates to persecution, but especially to grief. It is appropriate, and I would say even Christ-like, to take time and space to grieve a loss, to express our anger, our frustration, confusion, or other emotions we are feeling in a healthy way, because you and I are human beings, and, and God gave us emotions to experience. In our overwhelming grief, there seems to be just too much to process in the moment and to move forward with any other emotion or attitude or behavior. But whether we realize it or not, there is a purpose to our grief and anger and questioning and frustration. Through the experience, eventually we are able to see the hope that comes from Jesus just a little bit clearer. We are able to recall many of the promises of God from the scriptures and hold on to them just a little bit tighter. Scriptures like God is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Scriptures like the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, whom shall I be afraid? Scriptures like never will I leave you, never. Will I forsake you? Scripture is like, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It is possible to grieve and still see hope in view. It is possible to feel righteously angry for a period of time, and yet not let it sit and stew and fester into bitterness. It is even possible to turn the dial and shift ourselves from immediately questioning everything that's going on around us and instead be quick to listen for the voice of God in the void, to discern his will, his plan, and his purpose in the midst of all that's going on around us, especially when there doesn't seem to be any answers, any explanation, any direction, any solution or any remedy in sight. We face battles on numerous occasions, but the battle, my brothers and my sisters, is not the end. 
receive and inhabit the blessings of God even in the midst of battles. And the key is to prioritize listening before speaking and obeying instead of disobeying or even worse, doing nothing. There is a joyous freedom and a divine favor and blessing awaiting the follower of Jesus Christ who hears the word of God and obeys it. For, the, for receiving blessing upon our obedience, I want to offer just a few observations from this passage and a couple of spiritual disciplines that we can take home with us today. The first observation is that we are able to hear God's voice in the midst of battle. We can. But we must prioritize listening to him first. The scripture says everyone should be quick to listen and then slow to speak and slow to become angry. As I read this passage, a few questions came to my mind. Questions like, do we know that we can actually hear God's voice at any time? How can we hear God's voice if it's not audible? And once we believe we've heard God's voice, and that it wasn't us or the enemy, once we believe we've heard that voice, how can we be sure that we've heard that what we heard came from Him? And what does our anger have anything to do with listening for God's voice? Now certainly we can hear the voice of Jesus through the Bible. And we call this Bible that we hold the Word of God. And it is, in one sense. But let us not forget that Jesus himself is the Word. First century Jewish Christians did not have the completed Bible like in their hands like we do today. Now they did have the Law of Moses, they had the Prophets, and a lot of that was handed down to them orally before Bibles were mass-produced for anyone to have their hands on them. We can also hear God's voice through the preaching and teaching of the Word, through worshiping and song, like we just did this morning. We can hear God's voice through other people and through everyday real-life situations. But let us not also forget that even when we're, when we're by ourselves, we're not in church, we're not, you know, not doing anything, we're just by ourselves at the moment. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that was poured out and given to the believers at Pentecost and afterward. It may not sound like an audible voice, like we understand audible hearing. But it may sound similar to a thought that comes to our minds or a knowing that we hear in our hearts that did not originate with us. An example of this might be if, when seemingly out of nowhere, a person's name comes to your mind. That might be the Holy Spirit's nudging to pray for that person. Now, how can we be sure that what we heard is really from God? I would offer a few characteristics. Um, these are not exhaustive, but a few, a few of these characteristics that we find that are listed in the fruit of the Spirit that we know from Galatians 5 and from the directive in Philippians 4, verse 8. So when you hear that voice, that, that hearing in your heart, or that, that thought that comes to your mind, that came from seemingly out of nowhere, was the voice that you heard loving, peaceful, patient, kind, gentle? Was the message that you heard, was it true, noble, right, pure, lovely, excellent, or praiseworthy? If the voice that you heard or the message that you received does not align with any or some of these descriptions, then it may not have been Almighty God, especially if it isn't true. We know that Jesus is truth and Satan is the father of lies, so that if what you are hearing does not line up with Jesus and his teaching, it's not from the mouth of God. Now, why does James talk about anger alongside listening and then speaking? Found it interesting. Because he could have chosen any emotion and he chose anger. The anger that he speaks of is not the type of anger that's temporary and fleeting. Like, you stub your toe. <laughs> And you're angry that you're feeling that pain. It is an emotion. Uh, this kind of anger is otherwise known as settled anger. It's a type of emotion that sits in us for a while. It is stewing and it's sort of made our its home in us for a while. We remember that our Jewish brothers and sisters were scattered because they feared persecution and death. Stephen was 
just stoned because of his faith in Jesus. And because of their trials, it would be quite easy and natural to speak out in anger as a way to cope or regain some control over their lives or even just to simply make sense of what was happening to them. And God forbid the day should come if you or I ever had to flee this country because we fear that we would be killed for our faith in Jesus. If we had to flee to another country, we would probably face many difficulties. The language would probably be different. The, the customs and culture might be different. For however long we stayed there, we would need to learn the country's laws and where we could locate shelter and transportation and food and money. But most of all, we would be looking for a way to return home safely. Even in the darkest and most uncertain moments in our lives, we must remember that it is not the end. Scattering is not the end. Even in our trials, or even in the most difficult circumstances, we can still taste the grace of God. We can still taste His goodness and experience the blessing that comes by listening and obeying the voice of the Lord. A second observation is we are able to obey God's voice, not just here, but we can actually obey God's voice in the midst of battle. But we must act swiftly without delay. Without delay. The scripture says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, I brought with me a mirror this morning. <laughs> I, I won't point it at any of you, I promise. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just point it this way. Um, where can we, can someone help me this morning, where can we find mirrors? Where do we find them? Where do we see them? The bathroom. The bathroom, all right. <laughs> where do we see mirrors? Where do we, where do we find them? Vehicles, yep. Where else? In a store. In a store next to those security cameras, yeah. Anywhere well, else? Like actually, I was thinking when they try our clothes. Oh, I know that too. I don't try clothes. Um, <laughs> that's right, when they try and clothes. Yep, anywhere else? They're everywhere. They're everywhere. We find them in our homes. Yeah, so the restroom, or maybe you have a, a gilded mirror or something that's framed in the, in the, the hallway or somewhere. We find them in ladies, perhaps in our purses, if we carry a little mirror with us, in retail stores and restaurants, on our vehicles, and we might also catch a reflection in bodies of water, so, you know, rivers and pools or lakes. We, we might not call them mirrors, but we can certainly see our reflection in a digital camera or by using the camera app on our phone to take a selfie, which I'm sure all of us here do. <laughs> uh, we, we, so we find mirrors everywhere. And so why do we use mirrors? So we see them everywhere, but why do we use them? I'm sorry? To see what we look like. To see what we look like, yeah, okay. So we use them, their basic function is that so we can see, okay? And usually it's, its purpose is to see something that we would not be able to see without it. Seeing our own faces is a good example of that. I have seen babies, okay, I've seen babies that will spend minutes upon minutes upon minutes. They're, they're playing with it, they're on their backs playing with a toy or something, and all of a sudden they catch their reflection in a mirror. And they're just, they're just enthralled with the image of themselves in this mirror. And they're just staring at themselves for minutes and minutes and minutes with such fast fascination because it's the most unique thing they've ever seen in their lives. And who, whoever is in that mirror is doing the exact same thing I'm doing. <laughs> How is that possible? Whatever is going on, it's quite unlikely that they'll ever forget what they have just seen. James uses this comparison to gently point out that Christians who listen to God but forget what they hear and therefore don't obey is kind of just as absurd as someone who looks at themselves and forget what they look like. The two activities are intertwined. They go hand in hand. One activity doesn't make sense without the other. It's useless if we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ if there is no fun. 
our faith, no evidence of it, if we do not put it into practice. Especially in the midst of trial, whether it's a difficulty we're experiencing personally, or something that's happening in our families, our communities, or our world. We need to listen much more quickly than we speak. We need to obey God's instruction much more swiftly than running to the false comfort of our settled anger. Because sometimes the evidence of our faith is better shown when we spend more time on our knees in fervent prayer than on our feet in angry protest. Sometimes the evidence of our faith looks like showing love to a neighbor in need without seeking any accolades for ourselves. There is, we've had a few thunderstorms past several days, and a few days ago, when a thunderstorm hit, there was this 30 or 40 foot tree limb or branch that broke off and fell down, it was from our front yard, a pine tree that was right next to our mailbox, it fell uh, completely onto the road, completely blocking traffic in both ways, it nearly missed the power lines, it fell parallel to it, it almost hit it, but it didn't, so God protected there. I had no idea it had fallen. I was just minding my own business in my own house. And the next thing I know, I hear a chainsaw running. And I'm like, well, it's raining outside. Who's using a chainsaw? I'm like, what are they doing? So I go outside, and I met three neighbors who were working furiously to cut up this branch and drag the pieces off into the woods. You know, I, I did what I could to help them, but compared to the work they did, my contribution was rather embarrassing. <laughs> After my neighbors told me that the branch had broken off one of my trees, the only suitable response I had for them was, I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for taking care of this for me. I know I would not have been able to clear the road that quickly or that efficiently. One of my neighbors uh, turned to me and just said matter-of-factly, well, this is our neighborhood too. And I don't know if this man knows Jesus or not, but in that moment, I heard the voice of God clearly, and he reminded me of the scripture that many of us know so well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This was listening and obeying in action. I could tell from their conversation that my neighbors were blessed to be able to help. And I was blessed that they cared so much for a neighbor that they hadn't officially met yet. Third observation is that we are able to receive God's blessings. So not only can we listen, we can hear from God, we can obey Him, we can receive blessing, God's blessing, in the midst of battle. But we must persevere while we wait for it. The scripture says, but whoever looks intensely into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, perseveres, continues, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed what they do. What's so fascinating is how James is connecting what he says in verse 19 to verse 21 to here in verse 25. Rather than be able to, than being quick uh, to use our own words to combat trials, you know, express that anger, we are to receive the living word planted in us, which saves us. The living word is Jesus. And James calls the planted word in us that perfect law that gives freedom in verse 25. The believers he writes to are familiar with the law of Moses, specifically the moral laws as embodied in the Ten Commandments. And they may also be familiar with the psalmist's words in Psalm 19 verse 7 that says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing or converting the soul. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law perfectly and completely, and in him alone there is salvation. There is freedom in Jesus. If the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. 1 John chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, sum it up this way. This is love for God, to, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Listening and obeying God's commands are not burdensome. Listening and obeying to God's commands are an act of freedom. Listening 
don't obey God's commands are acts of fervent love as willing slaves to the one who gave his life for us so that we could be free from the shackles of sin. Listening and obeying to God's commands without delay increases our faith because we are placing our trust in Jesus who loves us so, so very deeply. In Jesus who sees that big picture when we don't see it ourselves. In Jesus who knows and understands our pain. And the blessing? Let's talk for a moment about blessing. The word blessing here in verse 25 and in many other places in the New Testament, it means happy or to be envied. And the Greek root here means to become long or large. Being blessed is when God extends his benefits to his children because they've trusted him. They've put their faith in him and they've demonstrated that faith by obeying his commands. One step at a time whether or not they are readily understood, knowing that God ultimately sees the big picture. I would also add that God blesses us simply because he can and simply because he loves us. The specific blessings God grants upon our obedience to him will probably vary from person to person, situation to situation. But did you know that there are a list of specific benefits that God extends to us, his children, to every single one of us who know the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And I will share those with you in just a moment. But first, I wanted to talk about a couple of spiritual disciplines that we can take home today as a result of, of hearing God's voice and obeying his commands. We will be blessed when we hear God's word and when we obey it. And so one of these um, spiritual disciplines uh, is, is not only to experience God, God's blessing, but to continually become more like Jesus. The first is to practice the spiritual discipline of holy listening. Now, if you don't know what the term spiritual discipline is, it's, it's simply an activity that we engage in regularly, on purpose, that to grow closer to Jesus and be more like him every day. It's something we do on purpose, intentionally. Holy listening can involve a focused time of prayer, uh, breathing exercises, we focus on the Lord, contemplation, meditation on scripture, or even just contemplation on the name of Jesus, and a willingness to be open to receive instruction from the Lord. I believe holy listening is something that we can take time for, something we do on purpose, perhaps in a place or a space where we spend time with God and where we are able to tune out everything else. So you might have a place in your home that you use as a dedicated space for your devotional time, a space to pray, read, or journal, or you might go for a walk outside or spend time in nature um, to, um, sorry, to read, pray, or journal, so I also have a place. Um, or even to listen for the voice of God as you're driving on the road. I do this often when I'm driving to work every day. That's my time with God. I pray, I try to listen to him, and I rock out to some music in the car. <laughs> That's my time when Jesus is in the car. But I would like to try some holy listening with you this morning, if you're willing. I had mentioned that one way we can listen for the voice of God is to meditate on scripture. In a moment, I'm going to read through Psalm 103. There are 22 verses, so it's a tad long, but... Contained within them are several benefits or blessings that God extends to every single one of us. So I invite you to take a few moments in this sacred space to tune me out <laughs> and to hear the Lord's message. And if a word or phrase jumps out to you in your minds, I invite you to write it down and to think on it this week. Psalm 103, a psalm of David. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. 
who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on all those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. What wonderful benefits the Lord gives to us, his children. The second discipline is to practice the spiritual discipline of service. Who can I help? Who can I bless in Jesus' name? Is there a need I can meet? And better yet, is there something that God is calling us to do as the body of Christ here at Brockway Wesleyan Church? Is there a need we can meet together? Are there any specific gifts that God has blessed us with that we are not currently using to serve others and point them to Jesus? Are we willing to ask him what the next step is? Acts chapter 4 tells us that all the believers at that time, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, in them all, that there were no needy persons among them. As the Lord leads us, as we continue to serve others, I encourage all of us here to remain united for the mission and purpose toward which God has called us. We are here at Broadway Wesleyan Church to exalt Jesus and to win souls. We are disciples who are heaven bent on making more disciples. We are prayer warriors who share story after story after story of God's deliverance, his healing, and his salvation when all hope seemed to be lost, but we knew it wasn't. When we listen and obey the Lord's leading, we will experience such a joyous freedom that no words could ever express, and we will see his blessing. As we serve others 